Hello, everybody. Um, so excited to be here today. Um, I'd like to thank the Decorative Arts Trust for having me and for funding my research into this really exciting family and apron. So, three generations of women in succession, all carrying maiden names and married names of the most prestigious families in the Connecticut colony, come together within the story of this apron from the 1730s you see here. Their shared namesakes and an inexact proviance allow for a complex tracing of these maternal and material threads. Together, these threads embody the uncertainty surrounding the apron. Thanks to the Decorative Arts Trust Research Grant, I had the opportunity to investigate this apron in person at the Connecticut Historical Society. I employed an object-focused approach to this apron's materiality by looking closely to discover important details. I was drawn to this apron because of what its details can reveal about its confusing proviance and these three women who left no material traces of their own histories. I explore the lives and choices of Mary Hooker Pierpont, Mary Pierpont Russell, and Mary Russell Talcott through this apron in the first chapter of my master's thesis. Today I'll introduce some of my key findings and propose their significance in telling these stories of these individuals in the early to mid 18th century Connecticut River Valley region. I hope to propose or hypothesize to the following questions. Who embroidered this apron? Which of these women owned it? And what can its materiality tell us about her or the maternal line overall? Mary Hooker was born in 1673 in Hartford, Connecticut to the son of the colony's founder, Reverend Thomas Hooker. In 1698, she married Reverend James Pierpont of New Haven, who helped found Yale. She gave birth to Mary Pierpont in New Haven in 1702. Mary Pierpont married Reverend William Russell and they moved to Middleton. Mary Pierpont gave birth to Mary Russell in 1720. Mary Hooker and Mary Pierpont died within months of each other in 1740. In 1740, Mary Russell married Matthew Talcott, the son of the current governor of the colony. No portrait of her has survived. She died in 1799 with no heirs, ending this direct maternal line. The map here shows the location and movements of these ladies at the beginning and ends of their lives. This apron was made sometime between 1730 to 1740. It would have been tied around the waist and fallen around the knee region. A lady would have worn it to a formal event or for a special occasion like at her wedding. She would have owned other cheaper and more practical aprons for day to day life, especially since this apron was expensive and exceptionally hard to clean. An apron like this could have been made by an elite woman herself or purchased ready made from England. Going forward, I refer to this apron as, Mary's, as the Mary apron for the sake of simplicity. <laughs> Even the basic details about this apron reveal exciting discoveries about its origins. My research has found striking evidence that this apron was made of Chinese silk rather than English silk. The ground of this apron measures 20 and a half inches to 34 inches, which would have not been exceptionally different from other short aprons during the period. It also has an exposed selvage that you can see here. The size of the English loom restricted silk widths in the first half of the century. Generally, English produced pieces of silk range from 22 and a half to 19 and a half inches. The Chinese created their silk on longer looms of 28 inches or more throughout the 18th century. Researcher Leanna Lee Whitman's study of the East India Company's records of Chinese silk and surviving extant garments finds that Chinese silk measured 28 to 31 inches, but could be up to around 34 inches. Based on these different sets of measurements, the, lengths of the, the length of the Mary apron most closely, closely aligns with that of the Chinese loom. So where was the silk from, England or China? Identifying where silk originated it also requires the observation of a number of other factors. One, tiny sequential vertical temple holes from the loom. Two, contrasting colored selvages. Three, a bright luster sheen. And four, a soft, clingy feel that is the result of mechanical calendaring. This apron lacks the contrasting colored selvage, but many other surviving silks also do. The high luster and soft, clingy effect of Chinese silk aligns with the notable haptic and visual experience of the Mary apron. And most pivotably, 
Minuscule temple holes identified on the apron match those attributed to the Chinese method of securing the selvage edge with two rods with two to five pins protruding at each end. As you can see in the, right, uh, in the white box on the pr in the presentation, five pin-sized holes have been found. Overall, this silk fulfills multiple criteria for classification as Chinese silk, and thus can be identified as such in my research going forward. The embroiderer also purchased a fine selection of what was known as sewing silk in the 18th century. Within the collection of the Connecticut Historical Society, an unfinished needlework included unused sticks of embroidery silk wrapped in paper that illuminate the opportunities for variations in colored threads. Mary Hooker Pierpont, Mary Pierpont or Mary Russell selected eight colors of silk embroidery thread. Yellow, white, fuchsia, light pink, light green, dark green, dark blue, and light blue. I believe this section on the eighth been pictured here best demonstrates this rich variety. The, the brightness of these colors and their lack of fading over time indicate that they were purchased pre-dyed. Rather than being dyed at home in the colonies with cheaper natural dyes, this lady bought silk dye by European professionals. Like all threads in the 18th century, these sewing silks were two-ply, which earned the, the nickname of twists. While the sheen of Chinese taffeta and the brightness of the colored embroidery thread already visually impacted a viewer, the addition of silver and gold thread made the wear truly spar sparkle, especially by candlelight. The Mary apron contained three types of metallic thread, fillet, bouillon, and frise. The fillet thread is fine silver and gold thread around a silk core that mimics sewing silk, typically. It appears in satin stitches and shading stitches, such as on the petals of the silver and gold flowers in the middle of the picture. Bouillon looks more like a metallic thread or coil, or more in a tube-like shape. It can be found in the core and on the tips of the, gold, the silver and gold flowers in the middle picture. It can also be seen on the petals of the tulip on the, on the left and the edges of the pink flowers on the right. So right along there and then right on the other part in between. The frise looks the most wire-like of all these metallic materials with its square edge. It can be seen on the right in the thin vines, the gold leaf, and the bow. All three of these metallic threads were likely imported from France. Notably, researchers at the Connecticut Historical Society proposed that this apron was not embroidered by any of these women, but instead by an English professional. They claimed, quote, executing satin stitches with metallic thread on such delicate silk fabric was a particularly exacting task associated with professional work, end quote. And therefore, they think that one of the Marys bought this apron rather than made it. Yet other surviving aprons and newspaper advertisements expel this notion and provide evidence that metallic embroidery was a skill taught to young colonial ladies. Along with gold and silver thread being advertised for purchase in the colony since 1712, advertisements for finishing schools explicitly promoting that they taught embroidery in gold and silver proliferated in the 1750s. Further, numerous surviving garments from the period that have unambiguous New England proviances demonstrate similarly complex embroidery with metallic thread. The work of these ladies, and who, who were from similar backgrounds as the Three Marys, shows the variety of stitches and types of metallic thread used. Through the creation of this apron, Mary Hooker, Mary Pierpont, or Mary Russell entwined themselves in the materials and practices of expanding British imperialism. Following the passage of, of the Calico Act in 1700 and 1721, the British Parliament restricted English access to foreign textiles. However, they continued to be sourced to the American colonies. Before this, chintzes populated the homes of the English and elite colonists by the end of the 17th century, century firmly establishing themselves in their decorative lexicon. In particular, wall hangings and bed covers called palpamores dominated. These designs were hybrid creations of motifs from the East and the West. They depicted motifs that derived from Persian and Indian art, as well as early 17th 17th century English embroidery. The most popular was a tree of life motif seen here. One of these examples was produced in India for import into America or England, while the other on the left is an early English embroidery copying this kind of textiles designs. Evolving from hybrid semi-fictionalized tree of life motifs, English and American embroidery adopted this colorful exoticism. 
They utilized the fluorated climbing vines of these imported textiles and the motifs they popularized. This motif was styled after the tree of, this apron was styled after the tree of life, along with a mixing of other characteristics that made it uniquely English influenced and regionally specific. Some flora and fauna can be identified on the apron while others cannot. A few of these botanicals were also fantasy creations. Wheat, thistles, tulips, and carnations can be identified with certainty, all of which would have been familiar to the English and the colonists. They would have associated them as domestic rather than foreign. For example, this carnation appeared in English gardens and the increasingly popular naturalist books. As you can see here, these two illustrations take similar forms in both of these renderings. The acanthus leaf also appears on the Mary apron and touches on another essential aesthetic movement of the long 18th century, neoclassicalism. This leaf featured in architecture and furniture throughout the century and proliferated in the minds of embroiderers. Indian designers also adopted the acanthus leaf into their arrangements, like in the smaller image on the right. This Indian pulpamore additionally showcases a vase with flowers growing out of it, which one of these ladies also incor incorporated into the center of her apron. While this motif derives from Persian sources rather than Indian, its co-optation into the chintzes and its association with the generalized European idea of the exotic orient was well established in the decorative lexicon by the 1730s. American cruel work embroidery survives more often than silk embroidery. It's a type of embroidery typically associated more with the colonies and was in fact actually practiced more in New England than in, than in England. It was more closely aligned with the tree of life motifs and bold color schemes too. Other historians have identified Connecticut as having a unique relationship to cruel work embroidery, namely in their use of it to embellish garments than, rather than predominantly household linens. For example, a cruel embroidered linen by Mary Myers of Connecticut was used in her fabric for her wedding dress in 1732. A rare 1763 portrait of a young girl shows her in a gown covered with cruel work. Both cruel work and silk embroidery trace their designs to simplified interpretations of earlier English examples. And those English examples were originally influenced by imported Indian and Asian textiles. The embroidery on the Mary apron likely drew some inspiration from colonial cruel work designs. From this inspiration, women like the Marys adapted these designs to suit their differing American Gentile needs. Oh, there it goes. Um, during the 1730s and the 1740s, Americans favored an apron design with a dominant border and a sprinkling of free-floating motifs within an expanse of white space. The New England colonists favored more lively designs and had less regard for heightened naturalism when compared with English embroidery. This can be felt within the decorations of this apron. Further, embroiderers in New England were known to employ a greater variety of stitches. This apron creator used satin stitches, long and short stitches, couching stitches, oriental stitches, and, Fre and French knots. Two other surviving aprons support this description of the Mary apron as distinctly colonial American. Ruth Elliott's apron demonstrates similarities to the Mary apron, as well as a remarkable similarity to the baptismal apron created by Mary Woodbury at Finishing School. However, Ruth's apron seems to be an earlier production and most likely was fashioned by another female in her family. I believe her mother, Elizabeth Marshall Elliott of Boston, may have been the actual embroiderer, especially because she would have attended finishing school around a similar time as Mary Woodbury. Aprons were a popular task for young women in their latter years of finishing school or soon after leaving when they had acquired enough skill to use expensive material to do complex stitching. It demonstrated their acquired skill following their expensive education and a legible sartorial form for all to see thereafter. These three aprons shared the overall form of a New England silk embroidered apron with their white ground decorated with scrolling borders of imaginary, exotic, and regional flora and fauna alongside a few free floating motifs that leave ample open space. These three embroideries create these effects with acute skill through their use of a variety of different stitches in a range of colors and advanced use of metallic thread. Beyond their general consistency and form and style, aspects of this apron are so similar that they point to the potential that these ladies were taught by the same instructor or used patterns drawn by the same person. 
the exotic flying phoenixes on Mary Woodbury's apron and the Elliott family apron share a similar shape, gold embroidered bodies, colorful wings, and a single red flower bud in their beak. The carnations on the Elliott family apron and the Mary apron both utilize gold fret for the bottom of the petals. They also have similar pink shading embroidery that create nearly identical shaped flowers. The tulips on these two aprons also appear to be similar in shape and shading, and it suggests the possibilities that these embroiderers followed similar patterns. <laughs> While it can never be definitively known what without additional primary source support, these various similarities point to some kind of connection between these aprons. Maybe Mary, maybe Elizabeth Marshall Elliott went to the same finishing school as Mary Woodbury in Boston in the 1730s. Mary Pierpont Russell would have succeeded these women if she attended finishing school in Boston in seven, the 1710s. But Mary Russell Talcott would have attended finishing school in the 1730s, possibly adding support to the latter's claim as the original embroiderer. Overall, the production of an apron in this rich stitch vocabulary created novelties imbued with Englishness and Orientalism. They were also a distinct colonial form of embroidery. It cre its creation was also personal. The embroiderer herself chose her colored and metallic threads, the type of stitches she made in her patterns. These choices demonstrate her agency despite this amalgamation of influences. The, no, the motifs and variety of stitches also tell us something about the Mary who embroidered the surface. The creation of such an ornate garment depended entirely upon the, the amount of leisure that allowed for such indulgence. No woman except for the elite had time to spare rendering more and more stitches upon a decorative garment, nor did they likely even learn all the techniques that gentle ladies were educated in during their youth. This apron was an object of leisure in of itself. It contributed towards the performance of an elite leisured lifestyle that even after completion continued to testify to the wearer's skill and gentility. So where does all this evidence leave us? We have discovered that this apron was made of mainly foreign materials. Chinese silk taffeta, imported sewing silk, um, dyed and spun in Europe, and French metallic threads. The motifs on the apron were drawn from English and Orientalist inspired sources, like poplars, that were adapted to regional preferences to produce something distinctly from New England. The number of different stitches used and the quality of these stitchers further supports its Americanness, but also testifies to the social standing of this maternal lineage. We, these three portraits of these amazing women have survived, but except for the one of Mary Russell Talcott, and we are not sure if one did survive or didn't survive or if it just never existed. The lineage was made up of women who received the finest of education and had the leisure time to produce sumptuous and practical garments to wear at formal events. While I don't have enough time today to get into where and when an apron like this would have been worn, my research in the mere survival of this garment demonstrates that they were cherished items beyond their monetary value. For future generations saw the investment put into these types of garments, but also the semiotic potential of them to materialize their ancestry and their inheritance of a claim to gentility. While the evidence outlined here today points to Mary Hooker not being the creator of this apron, her esteemed family background and advantageous marriage enabled the future production of this apron, indirectly, but maybe in a more direct way than we will ever know. Mary Pierpont Russell or her daughter, Mary Russell Talcott, are the more likely contenders. Regardless of the creator's exact identity remaining unknown, this apron and its unraveling story reveal fascinating insights into the sartorial landscape of consumption in the colonies and the minds of these elite Puritan ladies. I hope I was able to untangle some of these threads for you today. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time and attention.